So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, sponsored by the audiobook edition of Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, now available on iTunes and Audible.com, and of course, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and American League Baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Great photographs, whether shot by Ansel Adams or your Aunt Anna, capture a moment in time that people familiar with the moment, the subject, or the place can relate to for years to come. And even if you don't have any familiarity with what's in the picture, the good ones always relate an emotion, a texture, or some other sense that everyone can connect with. Now, I'm a, I'm a very big fan of great photography, so I was quite happy to invite Charles Gatewood to be my guest today. Gatewood, uh, who began working as a professional in the counterculture days of the 1960s, is not your grandmother's shutterbug. Not unless grandma was partial to being photographed in the nude, practice S&M, bondage, discipline, dominance, and or submission. And fast forwarding to the 1990s, he specialized in photographing modern primitives, erotic tattooing, extreme body piercing, and blood sports. In more recent years, he's into messy girls and I don't even know what that is, frankly. (laughs) Goths and vampires, radical pagans, Burning Man, and much more. Today, however, Gatewood is being celebrated for a subject he shot one April day back in 1966. That was the day he spent shooting one of the most revered photographs of singer and songwriter Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan with Cigarette is one of Gatewood's most famous photos and now is part of a limited edition handmade photo book he calls 61. It's a number meaningful to Dylan fans and to book collectors because that's how many copies of the new book uh, were produced. Prices for the book range from $1,000 to $3,000. Now, you can view the, uh, the complete Dylan uh, gallery online while I speak with Gatewood at uh, HTTP. What am I saying? You know this. It's Dana, D-A-N-A, Dana, 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 three Danas, Dana, 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 Dana dot com slash Gatewood. You can also find out more about... Uh, Charles Gatewood at acompleteunknown.com or charlesgatewood.com. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> I pushed the button again. Hey, Charles, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, Bob. Thanks a lot for having me. My, my pleasure. Glad to have you here. Uh, you know, my day with Bob Dylan, that's, a, that's something a lot of people wish that they could refer to. <laughs> what do you remember most about, uh, I think it was April 29, 1966? Yeah, well, God, it was a day that changed my life, let me tell you. I was I was young. I was 23 years old. I was living in Stockholm, Sweden, learning photography. And I'd been photographing for about a year and a half, and I still didn't know quite what I was doing, but I was starting to take some good pictures, and I had faith that if I stuck with it, I could become a professional photographer. So I had a job working in a Stockholm news agency, and... Um, After I worked there a while, they started giving me little privileges like the key to the equipment cabinet and a press pass so I could go out and shoot things on my own and and polish my skills and learn more about photography. And then um, a few weeks before I shot Dylan, Martin Luther King was in town, and they gave me the the assignment. They said, go to the press conference, take pictures of Dr. Martin Luther King, and I almost fainted because – Martin Luther King was one of my heroes, and here I was. It was my first kind of assignment, and I blew the assignment. I took a few flash pictures of Martin Luther King getting his award and shaking hands with a Swedish guy, and then all of a sudden it was over, and they they were shooing the press out the door, and I wasn't able to get up close and take the pictures I wanted to take. So I was when I heard Dylan was coming to town, I begged the boss for a crack at it. And he said, no, you didn't handle Martin Luther King well. And, you know, our number one photographer, <laughs> our number one guy is going to shoot Dylan. And I said, come on, come on. you got to, got to, got to let me sh- do this. So I got to go with second camera, just kind of the backup guy. And um, that day, it was April 29th, 1966. Dylan was on an around-the-world tour. Um, <clears throat> like a Rolling Stone had come out the summer before and was a giant hit. And Blonde on Blonde was in the works. That was just about to appear. And to me, it was Dylan's most exciting period. And every time he sang, How Does It Feel? I thought he was talking to me, you know, because I was <laughs> I was an expatriate 
living in another country because of the Vietnam War, and I didn't have any money. I didn't know very many people. I was trying to figure out what I was doing with my creative energy and my life, and all of a sudden, <laughs> it all came together that day. I wow. shot the press conference, and I shot the concert that night, and both were crowded with other photographers, and both were challenging jobs. Also, my skills weren't, you know, all that polished, and some of my exposures on the black and white film were way too heavy or way too thin. Some of the, some of the negatives didn't look like they would print, and I was kind of disturbed by that. But then when I started making some work prints, I saw the Dylan with the cigarette and sunglasses picture, and I thought, oh, boy, I got a good one here. <laughs> Uh, how, can you? I mean, can you tell us uh, how many times that's been reprinted and what kind oh, of money gosh. the guy makes on a photo like that? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting story. It was my first published picture, hmm. and it, it was the first picture I wow. ever got paid for. I mean, I was just I was 23 at the time. Dylan was 24. We were both pretty young. Anyway, the the news agency syndicated that picture, Dylan with the afro and the Ray Bans and the cigarette, and it went all over the world. And I made a few bucks on that, but <clears throat> shortly after that, I, I moved to New York and started being a professional photographer. And um, I also had pictures of Joan Baez, Allen Ginsberg, and some other, you know, celebrities, underground celebrities of the time. And I sold three pictures to a poster company for $105, Dylan, Joan Baez, and Ginsberg. And he said, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to use them, but here's some money. Thanks a lot. <laughs> a week later, they were in the windows of every poster shop in Greenwich Village. <laughs> and that, that Dylan with a cigarette poster went on to sell, who knows, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies. And that's when I learned to ask for a royalty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, but here's the funny part. Um, the rest of that shoot, I never printed the rest of that shoot. I made work prints of a couple of the other pictures, and I saw there was some good stuff there, but I kept saying, you know, one day I'll get, I'll get to it. I'll print those other Dylan pictures. Well, that was 43 years ago. Yes. And, um, you know, one day this spring I had a pipe dream, and I thought, you know, if I'm ever going to do that, I better do it. So um, I had to get some help on the negatives, printing the negatives from my partner, Dana Smith. She's an artist. She has this company, Dana, 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 which does limited edition artist books. Mm -hmm. And with using Photoshop skills, she teaches Photoshop, so she's really, really skilled. She was able to print some of those really thin negatives and really heavy negatives that I didn't think were printable. So um, to me, this is Dylan at his prime. I think his music was his, at his prime, and I think his, his look was really neat at the time, the Kate Blanchett look, you know. <laughs> um, so I was able to take some very memorable pictures of Bob, and now I'm showing the world all the pictures that didn't get printed from that 1966 take. That's what the book is all about. Well, and I want to remind people, you can, while you're listening to Charles Gatewood talk about these pictures, you can go online and see what we're talking about at DanaDanaDana.com slash Gatewood, G-A-T-E-W-O-O-D. Uh, it's very cool. And, uh, you know, I was going to ask you, uh, so uh, the reason these photos were, were doable now um, is, is largely because you found someone who, who knew how to really get in there with the technology and pull out the image, right? Yes, indeed. I, I mean, I could, some of them were printable, but some of the really thin negatives, she did something called stacking, which is some kind of Photoshop thing. She did some Photoshop magic, and she saved some of the ones that I thought were unsavable. Also, by the way, the, the site, uh, acompleteunknown.com, has my blog <clears throat> and information about the book. So every couple of days I go there and I write something about the book on the blog. And the show, there's a show at the Robert Tatt Gallery here in San Francisco also that opens next week. Definitely want to tell people about that. Uh, yeah, well, the blog is a, very interesting. Uh, the show info is at roberttatt.com, R-O-B-E-R-T-T-A-T.com. Right. Um, the official opening is September 12th, although the work will go up on September 3rd. So what else do you have hiding in your archives? Oh, gosh. Well, I've been photographing since 1964. And uh, my archives, I have about a quarter of a million <clears throat> excuse me, images, photographs, 
slides, negatives, uh, several thousand vintage prints. That's kind of what I live on now, my archive and my vintage prints. And mostly I have um, pictures of counterculture heroes. That's my thing. I photograph alternative culture. So, and, and, and coming back, you mentioned uh, Martin Luther King before. So no pictures from that event. Yeah, well, yeah. I have a few, but they're boring. <laughs> That's oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're mediocre. They're pictures of him standing there shaking hands with a guy. You know. Wow. <clears throat> to get back to the archive, um, on yeah. my website, charlesgavid.com, uh, there's a timeline and there's some highlights of each decade. So if anybody's really interested, you can go there and you can see what I was doing in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on. Basically, I was in New York for 20-odd years, and then I've been in San Francisco for the last 20-some-odd years. Mm-hmm. And I, I, uh, I, I think that you're you're not notorious for the Dylan photos. Those, those, those are those are something else. But you are fairly notorious for your sexual fetish photos. I hope you don't mind me using the word notorious. But how did you get started on that? Well, I went to my first nude party in 1966 when I went back to New York. Um, my grandmother wasn't there, was she? Uh, well, I don't know. Was she blonde and, and kind of cute? Uh, <laughs> Uh, a girl no, I knew actually, asked me if I wanted to go to a to a nude party, and um, I mean I'd heard about nude parties, but I'd never been to one. You know, she said you check your clothes at the door, and then you know who knows what's going to happen after that. And I said, yeah, can I photograph? And she said, yeah, I don't see why not. Oh God! So Those I was able. Days. I not only <laughs> went to my first nude party in the East Village, I was I was allowed to bring my camera, and that was a big. A really big deal for me because it was a fantasy come come to life, and I felt I could photograph anybody at the party, and indeed nobody seemed to care. And I even started posing people, and and they did what I asked them to do, and it, that was another big revelation for me. Oh my God, I can be a director, not just a photographer. And I felt like I was going into a secret society. I got so excited, and the pictures were really good too. There's some really nice pictures from that night. So I've been doing this since the beginning. My first book, Side Tripping, came out in 1975 with a text by William Burroughs. And that didn't have any explicit sex in it, but it had some very edgy, raunchy pictures. And uh, I've done about a dozen books, and some of them are rated G, and some of them are rated X. And I've got everything in between. Also, that's all on my website. Now, um, do you take these photos? And we're going to we'll come back to the to the Dylan. Um, uh, but I, I got to ask you about this. Do you take the the, the sexual photos uh, because they're a turn on, or because they're just different and it's just uh, somewhat shocking to a lot of people? Well, all of the above. I'm hmm. I'm one, I go in and out of um, different communities. My academic background is anthropology and art history, and in my anthropology classes, I was trained to do what they call go, going into the field and collecting information. I was formally trained to do that, and that's really what I'm still doing, although I'm doing it in my own way, not through a university or anything, but I'm still basically collecting information that fascinates me, and there are a lot of people who think my archive is really a, a unique treasury of counterculture um, documentation. Hmm. Um, as far as get, do I get high on it, of course I do. You know, there's a reason why I chose to photograph people instead of photographing still lives or, or nature or you know some of the other things people photograph. Photographing sexual stuff makes me high. Of course it does. You know, and that's part of the fun. Uh, I, and I was going to ask you though, what are you thinking about when you photograph a nude woman? Uh, is it lighting? Is it hair? Is it body parts? Where, where does the photographer's mind go? I know where my mind goes, but where does your mind go? Well, it depends on the shoot. I mean, I did a shoot last week that was XXX rated, and I wasn't thinking about the lighting, believe me. <laughs> uh, it depends very much on the shoot. I'm finding now that I've got such a good uh, reputation, you know, I'm pretty well known. I'm one of the best known photographers in the San Francisco area. And I've done a dozen books. You know, I've kind of shown, and I'm a true believer. Everybody understands that. I've shown what, who I am, what I do. I don't really have anything to hide or any hidden agenda. But now when I tell models that I want to do edgy stuff or I want to do a messy shoot or I want to do an explicit sexual shoot, they say, oh, that's interesting. What can I, how can I help you with that? <laughs> so uh, I have a 
I have models now who will do just about anything, especially if I give them, if I, if I pay them or give them artwork. Um, so it's kind of up to me. I can go off the map and, you know, try anything I, that I can get away with. It's really, really getting to be fun now. I imagine it's probably easier in San Francisco than it would be, say, where I am in St. Petersburg to find people uh, to do this kind of photos. Probably, but I bet you if you told some of those uh, beach bunnies that you were a famous <laughs> photographer and you would give them a $1,000 exhibition period if they would pose for you, I bet some of them would say, yeah, that sounds cool. All right, so so for you it's business. For me it would be, it'd be known as lying. Okay. Um, well, all you have to do is get a camera and then you're a photographer, you know. Damn, camera. Um, <laughs> have you ever drawn the line, Charles, at anything that you would not shoot? Is there is there a line for you? Yeah, every now and then. Um, well, along the way there have been certain subjects where I, I see the, the red flag waving in my brain. And I think it's just I grew up in the South. I was a Southern Baptist kid. So it's probably my early conditioning, you know, like don't go there. <clears throat> but um, there's not much. Mostly... It, my work is uh, compassionate and humanistic. I don't like any deliberate cruelty or um, making a, anyone do anything that they don't want to do. Everything I do is safe, sane, consensual, and um, creative and fun. And uh, sometimes I photograph extreme stuff, like I photographed some, in my blood sports book, True Blood, I photographed some young women cutting themselves, you know. But I didn't make them do that. That's something they do all the time, and they wanted to share it with me. So if you look at it that way, I'm the, um, the family photographer, the uh, underground anthropologist. And so anyway, that's the way I approach it. Well, and uh, while we're talking, I'm uh, continuing to buzz around uh, charlesgatewood.com, and I see uh, you, you, you haven't always just been the guy behind the camera, uh, as I'm saying with you and Annie Sprinkle. Oh, yeah. I, I put myself in the pictures um, sometimes. Lately, I've been doing it quite a bit. What I try to do is stay fresh and do work that's not the same old, same old, same old, same old. You know, <clears throat> a lot of professional photography, a lot of magazine photography is perfect. It's glossy. It's beautiful. Everything is the model's beautiful, the lighting's beautiful, the photography's beautiful, but you look at it for five seconds, you turn the page, you don't really care if you ever see that picture again because it looks like advertising, you know, or it looks like all the other pictures. So part of what I do is try to make pictures that are personal and pictures that are real and pictures that don't look like advertising, pictures that show the whole person. And um, I also try to stay actively experimental. Every time I do a shoot, I try taking some pictures with a $10 toy camera. I try taking pictures with super wide angle. I try doing it in different ways, shooting in different kinds of light. I make a list of my ideas and then my um, experimental ideas. And I try to work through the list so that part of each shoot is trying some really, really off-the-wall ideas that probably won't work. But it, when, you, when it all adds up... I do stay fresh in my work, and people come back because my work is different, edgy, fun, human. Oh, absolutely. And uh, what, pray tell, is a messy girl? I mentioned that in the introduction, but I have no idea what that is. Well, it's a girl who's covered or who's gotten messy in some way. I don't know where that one came from. Um, <laughs> my work is not theory-driven <clears throat> at all. It's very sort of emotional, and the work, the ideas come through me just like the Dylan book. Uh, I was sitting here one night thinking about Dylan, and I thought, you know, it's time to do that Dylan book, and bingo, here it is. Anyway, the work comes through me, and, and I got that idea of Messy, so I shot a model, Messy. She hmm. sat in a chocolate cake and smeared it all over herself. And oh, it was fun, kind of and she had a really, it, it breaks some big taboos, you know, when you do that. You can hear your mother saying, whatever you do, don't get messy. <laughs> don't play with your food so I shot some more of it and more of it and all of a sudden I was doing a lot of messy girl pictures so I proposed it to my German publisher Goliath Books and he said yeah we'll do a book of that and he did he did a 350 page book called Charles Gatewood's Messy Girls <laughs> wow and I thought I was kind of done with it but I'm not because uh, other models see that and they want to come do messy shoots of their own 
so I get out my kiddie pool, put it in the living room by the big windows, and they come over and they get excited by breaking the messy taboo. <laughs> <laughs> well, it beats going to the office, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I mean, never having been to an office, but I mean, I, I can imagine it's better. I'm thinking a, a day at your home is probably better than three weeks at anybody's office. Um, most people probably who see your photos probably think that you live an interesting life, even if it's not a lifestyle for everyone. Would you Would you say they're probably right? Oh, it's not just interesting. It's It's amazing. I never know what's going to happen next, and um, half my fun is when when people just out of the blue write me and say, "I want to do this with you. I want to go to Thailand with you. I want to do. I want to be a messy girl. I want to do radical sex pictures or whatever." And I think, well, here we go again. Here's another adventure. I mean, I just got a, I just told an English girl I know that she should. She needs a San Francisco boyfriend because she has a boyfriend in London. She has one in L.A. She comes here all the time. She needs a place to stay. She's a model. She needs a photographer. <clears throat> We're good buddies. She wrote back and said, you think so, huh? Maybe I do. So there's a new adventure brewing. Um, I mean, <laughs> come on. It's, it's a good life. It sounds like a good life. Well, also, you, uh, I'm 66 years old, and she's in her late 20s. You know, that makes it even more interesting. I was gonna. You, you must have been reading my mind. I was just. I was just doing the math in my head that you sold your first photo, 43 years ago, and I was trying to think. Well, you must be 60-ish, so 66. I'll be 67 in November, and um, I'm not done yet. I still feel pretty good, and I've got a lot of work still left to do. Have you uh, during this period of time and all the stuff going on? Have you ever married or done kids? Have you just? Uh, yeah, kept... I was. I was married for a while in the 70s. No kids. Um, hmm. And I've lived with five or six other women and um, had tons of girlfriends. Right now I live alone, but I've got a whole bunch of girls who I play with and, and work with. And um, I kind of like it this way. It seems to work for me anyway. I think I can think of a lot of guys who would like it that way. But, uh, you know, the rest of us are off just doing whatever we're doing. Um, do, do, you know, d digital cameras have made it, uh, I'm changing gears a little bit, but digital cameras have made it easier for everyone in the world to create instantaneous images, but not great photos necessarily. What is it that still separates the pros from the amateurs? Well, um, it's, a, it's vision and, and skill, developing your own vision and developing your own photo skills. The, the digital cam cameras are amazing. I don't use digital myself. I still shoot film, but there are certain things like shooting in really low light uh, with natural light, that digital does better than film. You know, it, hmm. it really does. I'm quite amazed when I see what some of those cameras can do. And Photoshop, too, is a really, you know, what a tool. Um, but I'm old-fashioned. I still shoot film. I shoot it the old-fashioned way. You know, one of the charms of my archive is that it's all films and prints, silver prints. There's no inkjet prints and there's no digital stuff in there. It's all film. And that's what the collectors want. So I think I'm going to stick with it. I may go to digital one of these days, or I may not. <laughs> well, Charles, we have a, I'm sorry, we have a question from the, uh, the live web chat that accompanies all of our shows. <laughs> um, this is uh, someone's, someone's wanting to know if, if, you could shoot any, any, if you could shoot any musician now, who would you want to shoot and why? I'd like to sit down with Bob Dylan again. Um, I'm a big Dylan fan. And uh, we're both from the Midwest. He grew up in Minnesota. I grew up in Missouri. Uh, we're, we're the same age. We have a lot of the same interests. And I think I'm so impressed that one just like regular kid from Minneapolis could change the world so in such a great way or just with his vision and his work. Mm -hmm. You know, it blows me away that one kid can do what he did. And it kind of gives you faith that we can all do something like that if we put our mind to it and develop our talents. So I just like to sit down and shoot the bow with Bob for a while, and maybe take a few pictures. And uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> there there have been some uh, some Dylan fans have asked why I don't do that book in a popular version because it's pretty pricey. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if I were if I could sit down with Bob again, maybe we could make the the big version of the book and then get a re real publisher to publish it and put it out there. But as it is right Maybe. now, what, 
Well, the, the limited book is beautiful. It's 11 by 14 on heavy paper, handmade. Each copy is handmade, and it's really special. But uh, perhaps one day there'll be a, a popular edition for 20 bucks. Maybe you better set aside a copy just for Bob, just in case he suddenly be- hears about it and becomes interested in having another. Well, I've been session. I've been wanting to send him one, but I'm afraid one of his one of his people might glom it on the way. You know, if I could put one in his hands, I certainly would. I'm sure there's somebody who could make that happen. It's not me, but there's got to be somebody out there. <laughs> well, I, one of our wholesalers is a uh, in L.A. A lead Apron. It's a it's a fine art bookstore. And Jonathan, the owner, knows Dylan's manager, so he said he might be able to do that. We've, we've already thought about that. Well, um, we are just about to run out of time, and I want to tell everybody, you can find Charles Gatewood's limited edition book, 61, o- only for sale online at Dana, 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 D-A-N-A, 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 Dana, 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 dot com slash Gatewood. You can also learn more about it at acompleteunknown.com. And if you can't afford one of the 61 published copies, you can view the entire project free of charge on the web at danadanadana.com slash gatewood. And if you're open-minded and curious about the rest of Charles Gatewood's body of work, check out his archive at charlesgatewood.com. He also, this is a multimedia guy, folks. He has a YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash a complete unknown one. That's the numeral one. And he's also on Twitter at twitter.com slash Bob Dylan Images, and he's on Facebook at, uh, let's see, tinyurl.com slash cgatewood. Did I get them all out? You got them all, <laughs> except uh, the, the title of the book is A Complete Unknown. Oh, I'm sorry. I and there are 61, there are 61 copies. But, uh, That's it. Oh, well, anyway, now we got it straight. Okay. It's a complete unknown, and I apologize for screwing that up. But, Charles, it was delightful to talk to you, and thank you so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tell everybody to write me. I promise I'll write back. I will do it. All right. Good luck to you. Take care, man. All right. Uh, And folks, for uh, more interviews with your favorite uh, uh, journalists, photographers, and authors, uh, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites. Whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, True Slant, Digital Journal, Vox, Podcast Pickle, Mediafly, Blueberry, Zencast, Current, or Odeo. And subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. Or subscribe to Mr. Media's blog on the Amazon Kindle Reader. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, www.andelman. I'm sorry, <laughs> www.twitter.com slash Andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give a piece of your day and spend it with us. Thanks for listening, everyone.